is a journalist, he's a media consultant, and of course an author. He's the editor of the Palestine Chronicle. He's a non-resident scholar, and I hope I pronounce this, Orphelia, Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is the author of My Father Was a Freedom Fighter, so that's his untold story. And of course, he is the author of The Last Earth, a Palestinian story, among other books. He has a PhD in Palestine Studies from the University of Exeter, and he is here to give us a reading from his latest book. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am here to, to tell you a story, or at least, at least to try to imagine if we are to retell the Palestinian story, what would that story sound like? If I take um, a group of average Americans and I ask them, what is the Holocaust? Have you heard of the word Holocaust before? everyone pretty much will say yes. If I ask them about Israel, immediately there is this wave of sympathy. They will immediately link the term Holocaust with why Israel exists, and so forth and so on. That's what we call the Zionist narrative. The Zionist narrative is the idea that Israel needed to exist as a moral imperative and it's to everybody's collective interest of why Israel not only needing to exist, but has to be defended, it has to be financed, and it has to be helped against any odds. If I bring the same group of people and I ask them, what is the Nakba? How many people would know what that is? Most likely zero. The Nakba, think of it as the Palestinian Holocaust, or it is the most defining date in the history of modern Palestine. If I tell them Palestine, most people wouldn't even know what that is. And if I have any Palestinians here, they will tell you when we introduce ourselves to people, where are you from? From Palestine. Pakistan? No, no, Palestine. Pakistan. No, Palestine. Pakistan? Okay. Or <laughs> Palestinian. Okay. You should have said so from the beginning. They know Palestinian, but they don't know Palestine. Why? And if you ask, what kind of image do you conjure up when you hear the word Palestinian? Most likely, it's a negative image. A Palestinian terrorist blew himself up earlier today and killed this number of Israelis. Three Palestinians were killed today. Palestinian militants, Palestinian terrorists. It is rare that you understand and put in context that Palestine and Palestinian can be positive values. So, in my book, I attempt to challenge this dominant narrative, the Zionist narrative, and provide an alternative reading to Palestine and the Palestinian and Palestinian history. The problem is for us as Palestinians, Palestinian historians, intellectuals, journalists, is that we are caught in this web where whenever we try to communicate who we are, we always have to do it in negations. We're not terrorists, we're not all Hamas, we're not all militants. This defensiveness in the way we present our story really constantly puts us on the defensive and if we rectify some of the damage, we can't possibly rectify all of it. So I thought, is it true that Palestinians can only understand themselves as a nation, as people, as individuals, in the context of Israel? I mean, I grew up in a refugee camp in Gaza. We used to sit and talk, have coffee, watch soccer, football, um, live our everyday life, operating outside the Zionist narrative. The Zionist lobby and the Zionist this and the Israeli that wasn't necessarily always part of our everyday discussion. We existed as people, 
first and foremost. And this is the story that I actually tried to tell. What if Palestinians are to tell their story independent, entirely independent from the Zionist narrative? What will that story sound like? Just before he died, Muhammad Abdul Ghani Al Lubani had transferred the deed of his Yarmouk home to his son's name and also left him with another small plot of land in Limjadil, the original village in Palestine from which he was expelled before walking to Jobar. The old man, a proud man, who paved roads in Nazareth and scooped cow dung in Syria, also left his family with his most prized possession, a large, old, rusting key that had opened the door to his cherished Palestinian home. The house no longer exists, but the key was kept in the family home in Yarmouk as a testament to their right of return. And now, the Yarmouk home no longer exists. The legacy of that original refugee who once walked to Jobur with his whole family in one straight line is still fully observed by his grandchildren, all of them. And Khalid Jamal Abdul Ghani Al Lubani, also known as Marco, is still walking to his resting place in one straight line. From afar, the Palestinian narrative is splintered among stereotypes and factionalism, Hamas, Fatah, the good Palestinians, the bad Palestinians, the moderates, the radicals, the terrorists, the good guys, our friends, our enemy, our allies, and so forth and so on are dissected and divided and splintered in every possible way. How do we reclaim the integrity of the Palestinian narrative? The story is essentially the story of a people, not the elites. Palestine cannot be reduced to cliches. The peace process, are you with the one state or the two state solutions? Hamas and Fatah, the West Bank and Gaza, Palestinians do not miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Henry Kissinger. That's what defines us. Cliches that have been written by men, Muslim men, who have very little integrity. Politicking men who puts us in whichever brand, whichever corner, whichever scenario that they wish. Mahmoud Abbas is good, Hamas is bad, now, Mahmoud Abbas is also bad. And we are not going to give money to the Palestinians because the money is taken from, by UNRWA and given to the families of terrorists. No questions asked. It doesn't matter that this is complete garbage. It doesn't matter that it has absolutely nothing to do with the truth. But what is the truth? The truth is the truth of the people. And the people are rarely ever listen to. A Palestinian is one out of two, either a victim or a terrorist. A victim in the point of view of, of Arab media and the sympathetic media, and a terrorist in the point of view of Western media. I would think that actually both categories are quite dehumanizing because we are more than victims. We actually are the exact opposite to that. We refuse our victimization. Palestinians, if there is one shared quality amongst them, is that they have resisted. You see, without resistance, there is no story. The old will die, and the young will forget. Ben Gurion once said, we will, we will displace the Palestinians and take their places. They only exist temporarily to make room for Israel and for Zionism and the Zionist states. To make the desert bloom, Palestinians are not a factor in any of this. 
but they actually are. If we pay attention and if we listen to them, they actually are. Ahmed and thousands more stared at each, other, at, at each tired soul as they walked past, looking for familiar faces or recognizable gestures as they stood near the border to a certain who remained alive of his family, friends, and acquaintances. When he was finally able to wrap his arm around his mother and all of his siblings, gratitude rushed through him, especially on learning that his sister Maliha, who was almost killed trying to save the gluttonous cow, was alive and well. Not everyone was that lucky, of course. So many familiar faces were assigned a place in memory. As their journey in this life would end in Al Falluja and not in Gaza's refugee camps, Ahmed lost many people dear to him, including his uncle and his family from his mother's side, and a teenage Egyptian soldier he had befriended in the early days of the siege. The two friends would walk every night into the early hours of the morning and talk about poetry and an ideal world where all the fallahin, peasants of the world, were united against imperialism, Zionism, and the feudalistic families that spoke of revolutions but chose to escape before the battle even commenced. These missing faces would haunt Ahmed in the back of his mind, yet many fallahin thought that perhaps there was some mercy in not coming back at all. If Palestinians did not resist, there is no story to tell. And resistance is not open for conversations and discussions. Resistance is resistance. It happens at every level, cultural, education, but also armed resistance. Because, as Franz Fanon once said, armed resistance is, the re is man recreating himself. It's not about what is permissible and what's not. It's not an ethical question. It's about a collective attempt to fight against the emasculation of an entire nation. If Palestinians did not resist, there is no story to tell. So it's not open for discussion. And it's the collective memory of the Palestinian people that gave resistance its value. You see, leaders come and go. Political factions come and go. Hamas? Hamas is a new phenomenon. Palestinians resisted before Hamas. Mahmoud Abbas is a new phenomenon. Palestinians resisted and fought well before these names even came to the surface and became part of the everyday political discourse. My father resisted, his fathers resisted, and his, and his father as, as well resisted. We resist generation after generation not because we are taking our orders from Iran or from this or that. To the contrary, resistance is, is a homegrown phenomenon. It's a grassroots thing. It's something that comes natural to people, any people under duress, any oppressed nation, anywhere. The first thing that comes to your mind when you are being oppressed is to resist. And that's what Palestinians have done. But they have done it for 70 years, that it's part of the very fabric of Palestinian society. Hiba, I tried my hardest to shield you from all harm. You saw me in my heyday as a fighter, in my military fatigue, but also as a broken man who worked under the burning sun as a manual laborer. My pocket hid the secret of a fake name on a forged identity card. All the while I was fighting for you, and I really thought we could win. I long fantasized about our final trip to Palestine, once 
it would be liberated. I imagined you wearing the thobe. I brought you from Burj al Barajne, embroidered with the colors of the flag. I imagined Ahmed as a fighter too, wearing a khaki outfit adorned with a black and white kufiya. In that fantasy, I was always old, but strong enough to remember everything clearly. I would guide you through our village in Wadi Shalalha, in Bir Saba. This is where your grandfather Aish fell in love with your grandmother Hamda, I would say. And he would smile and insist. I tell you the story all over again. And you needed to know every detail, from the color of the sky to the flowers that bloomed. He was a poor man too, a Bedouin, like me. And like me, he was short, dark, and wrinkled. But unlike me, he had little patience. His life was always hard. And when he was forced out of his village, that small piece of land we called Atur al Abiyad, he lost his mind. He lost everything. The elitist interpretation of Palestine has failed. For many years, we have been chasing a mirage the mirage of the peace process, Oslo, the land for peace formula. The West Bank is divided to area A, B, and C. Palestinians have no access to area C, 60% of the West Bank. That's under the control of Israel. The West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem are itself divided or taken from original Palestine, 22% of historic Palestine constitute the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. But now the West Bank itself is divided to area A, B, and C. East Jerusalem is also now being annexed to Israel. Gaza is under siege. Thousands of people have died in recent wars. Every day, there is a Palestinian who is killed, whether in the streets or in prison or somewhere else. A young man by the name of Bassam, I think, or just a few days ago, was arrested by Israel, and then a few hours later, his body turned out. It's the everyday reality of Palestine, and yet, if you watch CNN or Fox News, the conversation about something entirely different, something that is almost entirely disconnected from reality. It's that discourse that has failed. And the truth and the reality has nothing to do with the media distortions. Whenever I am on any American media channel, I am always on the defensive. So Ramsey, are you, do you condemn terrorism? Why is that the discussion? My people are in bondage, millions of them. Why is it that we are constantly being accused as if we are the victimizer and the oppressor? How did this happen? How did this story turn around in such a way that the truth is so distorted to this extent? By the time the flames were extinguished in that cruel November, hundreds had perished in the war on Gaza. With its beguiling name that echoed in mainstream media propaganda. While Gaza's graveyards expanded in various directions as people scrambled to bury their dead, to Joe's astonishment, Gazans were still grateful that the number of casualties was not as high as that of the previous war. They all kneeled down and prayed for their martyrs before burying them and hanging up photos of men and women across Gaza streets. It was a bid to keep their smiling faces alive just a little bit longer before the elements beckoned the abyss evanescent visual poems back to ashes. And the faces of inculpable dead children were immortalized in graffiti tributes atop somber gray walls throughout the refugee camps. 
reminding all who saw them how life can betray you. The following morning, they began crushing the destroyed concrete remnants of collapsed buildings, turning the gravel and grit into bricks, trying to rebuild the homes, schools, and clinics that were demolished. The task was great, if not impossible, because Gaza was still recuperating and under reconstruction after thousands of homes were destroyed in the earlier war a few years ago, deemed Operation Cast Lead by the Israelis. The destruction was happening at a much faster rate than the reconstruction, yet somehow, Gazans ignored this and kept on fighting, weary and angry, but steadfast as ever. Gazans are a unique people, unmatched in their kindness and spirit of rebellion. At least that is how they struck Joe Catron when he first arrived in the Strip in the early months of 2011. He came to stay for a couple of days that somehow turned into a few years. The history of Palestine has rarely been founded on the expectations and the aspirations and the demands of the people. It's always been almost orientalist in its approach. There is this theory, I'm not going to bore you with anything too academic, but this theory called the great man theory, it's a theory that defined history. History is made by great men. And really, I mean that literally, men, not women, men. Usually white men, but history is made by great men. Great men are the ones who change the course of history, in a good way or in a bad way. The people are followers. They can be easily manipulated. They're not factors in anything. That version of history is no longer actually kind of paramount in Western academia. But sadly, it's still applicable in the way that Palestinian and Middle Eastern history is told. I remember at the University of Washington, um, the first history serious political science class, my professor said to sum up the class before we even started, the Middle East is made of strong leaders and weak people. I just remember, I did not have the articulation to tell him, you can't be right. This is, this is bogus. But I felt that there was something wrong about that story because, or that assumption because, number one, that man has never been to Gaza or anywhere in Palestine. And really, when I think about my grandfather, my grandmother, my parents, my friends, my neighbors, are they weak? Are they incapable actually of doing, they're just waiting for a great leader to come and save them or take them this direction or that direction? But the fact is, this is completely untrue. The only way we can actually rearticulate the Palestinian story is if we ditch that whole great man theory nonsense aside and think of an alternative way of telling history. How about this? History from below. History from below argues that people, you and I, all of us together, we are the ones who actually channel history. But we channel it in the long term. We don't channel it immediately. We don't make press conferences and decisions and Trump decided to give Jerusalem to Israel and that's how history is made. History is made throughout the years of how Palestinians will continue to fight that decision and how Palestinians will one day reclaim Jerusalem as their capital. But it takes years for that to happen. You see, if it's up to Israel, and if it's up to the Zionist narrative, 
They really wish that there's no Palestinians. The whole story would have been sorted out 1947, 48, the Nakba, the catastrophe. Palestinians are driven out. They, they, they immerse themselves and merge into the multitudes of the Middle East, and the whole story is forgotten. But here we are. After all these years, we're still talking about it. There is still a Palestinian people. And what makes them happen? What is, what is that force that makes the story relevant? if it were not for the Palestinian people and for the resistance and the steadfastness of the Palestinian people. If you want to truly understand how people's history will work, think of the first Palestinian uprising, 1987, when a nation was unified, Muslims and Christians, West Bankers, Gazans, Palestinians in, in today's Israel, and everywhere they stood, one chant, one slogan, one demand, and they fought. For seven years, for seven years, they stood their ground and fought. And that was the real power of the Palestinian people. When people come and say, will there be another intifada in Palestine? What they mean is, when will the Palestinians rise again and reassert themselves as part of this equation once more? It doesn't work that way. Palestinians and people in general don't work on a signal. You can't tell them intifada, no intifada. These are the forces that just comes from within organic, the organic power of mobilization. And Palestine has never been empty of that. It's always been part of the Palestinian collective experience. Israelis, Israeli snipers stood motionless in awe of the crowds whose masses extended from the army tents to the sea. It was the furthest horizon the soldiers on the watchtower could view. Even if they had wanted to fire, they were not, there were not enough bullets to take out everyone. Young and old, weak and strong, they all walked in unison, marching in front Women lead the way as icons of female power, while children carried flags that, had, that they had designed with crayons. The soldiers hid. They hid behind the towers and trenches, not firing a single bullet. The refugees of the camp, who had been trapped for weeks, came out of their homes in disbelief when the masses started arriving in Boraj. Thousands hugged random thousands in a scene of solidarity never witnessed before in the history of the two camps. As the Nusayrat refugees celebrated their victory upon their return, Umm Marwan felt the hug of two arms embracing her from behind, folding gently upon her neck and chest. Mother, said a voice that had, that had grown hoarse from the incessant ch chanting. It cradled her every being. But what are the obstacles that are facing the Palestinian voice? Why can't we be out there? representing ourselves. Why is it on CNN and Fox and every other place, the expert is never a Palestinian? Why? Even in Senate committee hearings, when they discuss Palestine, the expert witness is never a Palestinian. It's always an Israeli, and when we find an Israeli who is sympathetic to Palestinians, maybe, are we incapable of articulating our own discourse? Don't we have enough intellectuals? Enough academicians, enough human rights activists who are capable of indeed articulating a very profound and strong and convincing Palestinian narrative. But we're not supposed to be existing. Because, because you see, Israel had made that claim that, that this land, Palestine, has no people, and it should be naturally, a home for people who have no land. Therefore, Palestinians have to be completely evaporated from that equation. They are not part of the discussion. For 70 years, 
we have been trying to prove that we are not an invented, or we are not an invented people. That's the term they have for us. We're an invented people. We're a group of people who decided to get together and create a false identity. We don't go back to time immemorial. We don't go back to the Bible. We're not an ancient nation. Benjamin Netanyahu is Semitic, but I'm not. Somehow, if you come from Eastern Europe, you reclaim that identity that's never been part of your collective experience. I am not. My people are not. That's how history is rewritten. And that's why we need to challenge that history. And the first thing we need to do, we have to reclaim our identity. This is not about a peace process. It's not about who is willing to negotiate unconditionally or not. It's about us as Palestinians having to reclaim our identity, who we are, what makes us who we are today more than any other time in the past. Sarah's parents were determined that she would grow up to defy that norm by recognizing herself as a Palestinian Arab Christian from Beit Jala. But they could not protect her entirely. Sarah's understanding of herself came into question one day when her second grade teacher, Mrs. Levy, asked her pupils a simple question. Where do your ancestors come from? The exercise was meant to highlight the wonderful fusion of cultures that Australia is supposed to represent. Mrs. Levy had planned to have the children color the flags of their countries, that their, of the countries that their families had come from, and then hang them around the classroom. It was a testament to inclusion and multiculturalism in which Mrs. Levy strongly believed. Yet all of that ended when Sarah declared enthusiastically, I am from Palestine. Sarah did not know that Mrs. Levy was Jewish. Even if she had known, she would not have cared or have understood the layered meanings of that identity in relation to Sarah's as a Palestinian Arab and Mrs. Levy, according to some, as her political antithesis. Until that moment, grade two had been quite uneventful. Sarah had focused hard on school. She was always happy there, away from her stressful home life. Sarah's English skills were constantly improving, and aside from her father's violent temper, things were going quite well for her. But when Mrs. Levy said, there was no such thing as Palestine, and immediately moved on to another student, ignoring Sarah's bewildered expression, something inside the little girl forever changed. It could not be that Iyad had been lying to her all of her life, and that her mother and even Uncle George were part of a conspiracy to convince her that she was something she was not, and for what purpose? Palestine was a fact. She relived the memories of her visit. She had been there. She had smelled the fruit trees and tasted the dried thyme and olive oil and had dipped her falafel into the, home, the homemade hummus. She had seen the villages and the welcoming children who spend their entire summer vacations plotting ways to acquire candy and the kind village elders whose kisses lift traces of a unique and ancient scent. Palestinian Jesus may have looked tortured and dazed as portrayed in Beit Jala's many churches, but he was kind and he said gentle things about the poor and he called on those who went astray to return to God's kingdom. We have to change our perspective entirely on this. We have to reimagine Palestinian history. 
we have to reimagine the Palestinian discourse altogether. The Palestinian history starts with that man over there, Ali Abu Mghasib. This man had fought in every war in the Middle East. He even, at an old age, he went to participate in the resistance in Iraq. And when he finally made it to Gaza, penniless, poor, without her, his family, that are still lost somewhere in Syria, he doesn't know whether they are dead or alive, he actually went to the front lines. And he asked the fighters there if he could join them. The problem is, he's old, but also one of his legs don't function at all. The young men bought him kebabs, he said. He said, they fed me, and they drove me home. And they said, well, you fought the good fight. It's our job now. He lives in a little trailer with no running water or electricity, somewhere in Khan Yunis. Who is to tell his story? And millions of others like him. Ordinary people, refugees, poor, underclass, and working class Palestinians, who indeed have shaped their own destiny and have resisted and made tremendous difference. Because without them, I wouldn't be standing here today. And without them, there is no story to tell. A long time ago, Layla's grandparents had built a house in Syria. It resembled their earlier home as closely as possible. Perhaps this replica of their place in Palestine was meant to heal old hidden wounds. Their little haven, sprinkled with happy memories under the orange trees, and a fountain of stone and marbles in the center of their small orchard allowed them to travel in dreams to the home they, the home they longed for. During the war, they had to abandon this new house too and escape to Jordan, where they became refugees once more. Where will they return when the war is over? To Syria? To Lebanon? Or will they stay in Jordan? But why not Palestine? Why never Palestine? Though Layla had never been there, the rusty key in their family home was clearly marked. The key to our home in Palestine. We will die here, here in the last passage, here and here. Our blood will plant its olive tree. I would like just to say a couple of quick things. Um, I have uh, my first book published uh, called Searching Janine, and I have copies of that book. It's uh, with uh, Professor Noam Chomsky. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. And I'm giving a copy for free to anybody who uh, donates to um, Kinder USA tonight. And the other thing I'd like to say is that it really is important that we kind of also redefine our relationship to charity. It's not, you know, there's a difference between charity and empowerment. And what we are here to do is to empower the Palestinian people. Uh, there is a concept that I'm sure many of you are familiar with called intersectionality. It's the idea that all of our causes and our fights and our uh, uh, and our struggles somehow are intertwined. And they intersect. And when I empower you, I empower myself. When you empower the Palestinians, you empower yourself. Uh, because all of our causes, at one point, they meet. The struggle for uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, or Native American rights and, 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 and so forth. Uh, working class Americans, disadvantaged Americans. It's all part of the same fight. So, so we need to really kind of reposition ourselves a little bit. We are not just you know, here to bestow charity on people. We are here to take our part in, in a more collective struggle. 
That's how, at least that's how I see it. And one thing that I know that Kinder USA does, because I worked with them in the past and I tried my very best to help in, in raising funds, is that they actually give the money to families so that they can preserve a degree of dignity as they carry on uh, in their lives in Gaza and elsewhere. So really help in any way you can uh, today or in any other time in the future. If anyone has a question before, I know you're eager and me too, to go and eat. But if you have any question, I'm happy to address them. Rick. Right. Uh, so the question is, in one or two sentences, or perhaps three. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, in my opinion, is the solution to this situation in Palestine? I kind of grew a little bit um, cautious of the word solution, because cause in my opinion, the issue hasn't been the lack of creative solutions. The issue has been that you have a regime, a militant regime that is sustaining this racist apartheid rule in, on Palestinians, in defiance of international law, in defiance of every human norm, in defiance of, of, of humanitarian laws, in defiance of everything that we as people all around the world collectively hold dear and, and, and um, unacceptable, they are defying all of this and they refuse to, refuse to relent, they refuse to change their strategies, they refuse to consider the Palestinian as an equal, they refuse to grant Palestinians their rights. So that's why I am a bit wary of the term solution because I don't think Benjamin Netanyahu is really just expecting Ramsey to come with this genius idea and then Benjamin would say, aha, at least someone, you know, at last someone has come up with this idea and this is going to be the solution. The issue has never been that and will never be that. Um, let's try to imagine that I'm an anti-apartheid activist in the, during the apartheid regime in South Africa. And someone asked me that question, what would the answer be? Obviously, there has the black people who are treated extremely poorly, uh, discriminated against in every possible way, where people are classified based on colored categories. And by the way, during the time of apartheid South Africa, you can buy your way out of certain categories into others. So the Lebanese were white in South Africa. Palestinians were not. Even though we are actually the same people. Essentially, we are the same people. We come from the same historic roots. So it wasn't just a question of color, it was a question of money, power, class, and so forth and so on. What would the solution be? Of course, ending apartheid in South Africa, and it has. So it's not really a genius solution that is required. The Israeli apartheid needs to end. Palestinian rights have to be granted. People have to be respected. Walls have to be demolished. Checkpoints have to be a thing of the past. Human rights have to be preserved and respected. Once all of these things take place, whatever the political formulation of a solution, it really matters very little at the end of the day. This is why I'm wary of the term solution. If you insist that I, I be more specific, and I, I think I answered with about 35, 40 <laughs> sentences so far, is that I would say I don't see a way out of this. We have to coexist in this piece of land between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. We have to coexist there. And the formulation cannot be racial segregation. It can't be. All of these attempts at cut and paste a solution, area B, C, let's remove the Palestinians from here and bring the Jews over here. This nonsense cannot stand in the 21st century. It has to end. Ending the apartheid and coexisting in that piece of land. And that's what Palestinians are driving for. And I know we will get there. Yes. Yeah, I've heard Nikki Haley lecture the United Nations this week about uh, the United Nations spends too much time dealing with Palestinians, and she insinuated like it was just a waste of time. Uh, so I don't know where she gets off representing. 
Thank you. I think in the age of Donald Trump as a president, it is the age of Nikki Haley being the ambassador uh, of the US into the United Nations. I think it's a perfect fit, uh, to be completely honest. Uh, Nikki Haley, when she gave her first speech before the uh, Israeli, the powerful Israeli lobby, AIPAC, in Washington, D.C., she declared, and her message was to the Palestinians and their supporters, there is a new sheriff in town, she said. Um, and they will know it. When I kick my heels, and she, she tapped on the, the ground, uh, they know that I am ready for action. And everybody st you know, stood, rose in the standing ovation. Nikki Haley, the liberator, the sheriff, came on, his, on, her, on her horse and, and all that. Now, the thing is, Nikki Haley, um, a friend of mine actually refers to her as the embarrassment of the United States and the United Nations, as opposed to the ambassador, which is so true, represent this kind of new age thinking uh, in, in the US administration. And that is, we're not benefiting from Palestinians. They are really of no political capital, of no use. The, the, the political base of Donald Trump is the right-wing religious evangelical communities. These people have no lost love for Palestinians. They can never be of any value, those Palestinians, to us. Therefore, why are we wasting our time? Why are we wasting our money? Why are we wasting our efforts? While we should be focusing to that uh, community or to that criteria of people that we care about. So now, really, there's this love affair that's going on between the Israeli right and the American right under the auspices of Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. Of course, it is, it's a disastrous combination. Because in, in some strange way, the, the alt-right and the, the, the evangelical right in the United States, really, that's where most of the anti-Semitism comes from in this country. Yet somehow, the Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, finds them as the most plausible constituency for his political program, just the oddity of it all. In my opinion, this is a temporary, a temporary alliance. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump is going to last long, nor do I think that Netanyahu has much of a political future. But at the end of the day, what is happening here is that the United States is divesting uh, from historical rule in the, United, in, in, in the Middle East. They are no longer the self-declared honest peace broker, and they are increasingly being sidelined, or they are sidelining themselves, uh, and, and you know, the last leaf is, leaf is being dropped right now. And Nikki Haley wants to make sure that she capitalizes on this moment as much as possible. The American embassy in Tel Aviv is going to be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But not in two years, as Tillerson said, uh, or more, this May. And the day that they actually chose for removing the embassy, or re relocating the embassy, is May 14th, so-called Israel's independence, and the Nakba day, the cat catastrophe day for the Palestinians. They couldn't choose a more painful or a humiliating day, but that day. It's like someone stabs you and is twisting the knife and twisting the knife and twisting the knife. And that's what Haley is doing. She is truly carrying through with all the promises that she made to AIPAC. Um, and she is, Nikki Haley, is being hailed as possibly the, uh, a person who will contend at one point for the presidency of the United States. Um, and I am not surprised. She knows exactly uh, uh, which, you know, which uh, uh, hand to kiss and, and the relationship with, with uh, uh, um, Edelson, Shield, uh, Sheldon Edelson. Uh, is really a testament to all of this. They are following the money, they are following the power, and Palestinians are not part of this equation whatsoever. And this is why we are doing what we are doing, because we are trying to appeal to the American people to understand that there is much more at stake here than the politicking of Haley and Trump. There is much more um, at stake than all of this. They have to understand, and they have to understand things from a Palestinian pers perspective for once. Ed. So uh, the rest of the world is not going along with this, and so this further isolates the United States. 
So what uh, prospects do you see if the United States is no longer oh, it's a, definitely uh, going to turn out positive. I think broker, the positive, so called, the, po the, the East, first positive element uh, in all of this uh, is that Trump has denied what do you think about uh, the that? Co collaborating faction within the Palestinian leadership, denied them that, that opportunity to sell this mirage of the peace process over and over and over again. Um, it is, it is this illusion of a peace process that kind of sustained the charade. The American leadership, the American uh, uh, status as self-declared honest peace broker, and so forth. This has been going on for a long time, by the way. This goes back to the 70s, when Henry Kissinger started his so-called shuttle diplomacy, if some of you remember. That's when the new terminology, that new discourse began appearing. And Palestinians were paraded back and forth to accept certain demands. You need to agree to you under resolution 242. Yasser Arafat would go to Geneva and declare, I accept, you need to renounce violence. He would go and he would renounce violence. He had to jump so many obstacles. Since then, Palestinians have been jumping all of these obstacles to meet the expectations and the demands of the United States government. And after all of these years, after having this amazing, impressive apparatus in which thousands of men and women are employed to sustain all of these NGOs and this whole peace process deal, he comes and he says, nope, enough is enough. Jerusalem belongs to Israel, and we are going to back them up on that, and Palestinians were not going to even give you money. Now, that kind of really leaves the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas and these people, kind of high and dry. But wait a minute. We have a whole culture that has been created around this terminology. We have a government. What kind of a government and sovereignty that can actually be established under military occupation? Mahmoud Abbas, in order for him to leave the West Bank, to go and give uh, uh, a speech at the United Nations, he actually needs an Israeli permission. What kind of sovereignty is that? It has been a joke, and I think, although unwittingly, Donald Trump has, has actually ended all of this, leaving Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian leadership in a position where they have to make one out of two choices. Either declare that they are completely and forever subservient to the dictates of this discourse, or to side with the Palestinian people who are absolutely fed up. And this is the debate in Palestine right now. This is the debate among Palestinian intellectuals, and this is the debate in Palestinian media. We don't just want to free ourselves from the confines of American hegemony over our cause, but we need to also free ourselves, ent ourselves entirely from the entire peace process discourse. Mahmoud Abbas is now walking around with the peace process and trying to find someone else to actually buy that whole package deal and, and take charge, basically replace the United States. He went to the French and he went to the Russians and said, like, can someone please take over? But take over based on what basis? The basis of the two state solutions and the peace process all of, all, and all of this? Or something else, something new entirely? Perhaps something that the Palestinian, that's something that is actually originating from the aspirations of the Palestinian people, not the political whims and dictates of Mahmoud Abbas. That's a, that's a good question, of course. And um, it's difficult to answer this question. Because, of course, there are many allies uh, and, you know, for Palestinians, not just in Israel, everywhere around the world. But also, there is a dichotomy in all of this. Um, and this is why I have been arguing uh, and argued from the beginning that we need to distance ourselves entirely from the Zionist narrative and we need to re recreate a, the Palestinian narrative, go back to what we Palestinians call the constants, the constants of the national, something that is unchangeable. That's what we want, this is what we aspire for. Because honestly, in Israel, we've had allies and or we thought we had allies. But with time, sometimes these, these alliances and, and, and those friends and comrades that we have in Israel do not really stand the test. For example, during the war in Gaza, 2014, most Israelis, including the so-called left in Israel, stood 
with the war against the Palestinians. Um, the most progressive organizations, the labor parties, the Meretz party, the Histadrut institutions, from the very beginning really took on an anti-Palestinian uh, uh, attitude. The Histadrut is the, the labor institutions in Israel that were established before the state of Israel itself was established in 1948. They modeled themselves based on a socialist paradigm. Yet one of the very early decisions that they made is barring Palestinian and Arab laborers from joining the unions of the history group. This is why I hesitate. I'm not saying that they don't exist. Of course they are there. You know, I mean, the, the, the person who wrote the foreword to my book is a very dear friend of mine, Ilan Pape. He's an Israeli. So our problem here is not with, with, with the identity of people, but with how serious and sincere and genuine are you really about supporting the rights of the Palestinian people? Can you support Palestine unconditionally and fully without providing this kind of disconnected narrative? I am with the right of the Palestinian people to have a state, but the Jewish identity of Israel have to be maintained. You can't. It's either you are entirely on the side of, of right and rational and just, or you're not. These kind of half positions cannot be taken anymore. So I do hope that we have a constituency in Israel that truly and meaningfully support the rights of the Palestinian people, but we can no longer accept half positions and half solutions. Yes, sir. What's the uh, progress of uh, BDS? BDS is, is, is a powerful, powerful yeah. platform. Really, it, it took many by surprise, including some of us who were part of that movement from the very beginning. Because it really kind of changed the rules of, of, the, the game, of how the game is being played in the first place. You see, in the old days, when radical Palestinian organization comes out and, and the push for new demands or new ideas, they are eliminated. Many Palestinian poets, intellectuals, artists were killed by the Mossad and, and by all of this. BDS allowed us to enlarge in our movement to a global level. We took the fight, we decentralized the movement from making it essentially Palestinian. It's still essentially Palestinian, but it has a global dimension. That's what BDS has done. You see. For 70 years, Israel has done everything in its power to legitimize itself. It really is like, um, it's like a little boy. Could be a hideous uh, metaphor, but I'm gonna try anyway. <laughs> like a little boy who wants to be a man. So he dresses up like a man and he wears a tie and he walks like a man. It's like, Dad, am I a man yet? But he's still a little boy who is pretending to be a man. The thing is, Israel from the very beginning was so eager to be stately, legitimate. Um, they did everything in their power to do so. They got the United States, first Britain and France and others, then the United States to sign off. Israel is a legitimate state. Israel is a state like no other. Israel is a miracle among nations. Yet there was something deep, deep insecurity about Israel. It knows it's not. It knows it can't be. Because you can't possibly be living a normal existence when you have millions of people caged like animals behind walls and checkpoints and apartheid walls and so forth. You can't be. This nagging reminder that your birth was illegitimate on the ruins of 600 Palestinian villages. Millions of people were sent all around the world finding shelter and homes and trying to survive the hideous birth of Israel. They know it's not. We are that reminder that Israel is not a normal state. This is why Netanyahu is constantly talking about BDS is delegitimizing Israel, the fear of delegitimization. If you're legitimate, why are you worried? Why are you so obsessed with the idea? You're legitimate, but you know you're not. And this is why they are mixing up all the metaphors. They are delegitimizing Israel. Israel is a Zionist movement. Zionism and Judaism is the same. It's not. But they want us to think it's the same. Therefore, if you join BDS, you're anti-Semitic. What? What kind of rational thinking is that? But that's what bothers them so much, is that everything that they are doing 
to block that movement. They are trying every technique, but they are not used to this kind of struggles before. They are used to a Palestinian militant with a gun. They are used to Palestinians um, taking actions within their confines of refugee camps and so forth. We are, they are not used to a global movement that in, involves singers and artists and churches and mosques and synagogues and intellectuals and poets and people all over the world speaking so many languages. They are on Twitter and social media and in the streets and they are everywhere. How do you fight that? So they are working very, very hard trying to decipher this BDS movement. And here's the thing. The more they do to delegitimize the BDS, the more they do to actually increase awareness of BDS. This is an argument I've made and I'm making again. For us in BDS, this is a win-win situation. Because if we make our point, we win. When we get a famous pop star like Lou Ordor to, to boycott Israel, millions and millions of people who are following her on Twitter and everywhere else would realize, wow, this famous singer is boycotting Israel for moral reasons. I need to find out why. So we win. When they try to fight back using this kind of shabby, disorganized techniques, they bring us into the fore once more, and we get involved in the discussion. So either way, we are going to start a discussion on BDS and on Palestine and the human rights of the Palestinians and the justice for the Palestinian people and so forth. So either way, they can't really win. And this is why BDS is a very important strategy that Palestinians need and are utilizing fully uh, to their advantage. Sir. That the solution regarding and the other one, the issue that you're, I know you're a part of for the United Nations trying to get that resolution going. Uh, the solution regarding. I can't remember. You were working with Sally Shaw and some other people from the Jewish Jewish Voice. You're talking about 1419, the Betty McCollum or what? The what? Betty yes. McCollum still? The Palestinian children. Well, that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, things lately. Like, I can't keep track of. <laughs> uh, I now I think the the, the question regarding the UN, um, the, um, the, uh, the the House resolution you're referring to. <laughs> 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 um, I now I think the the, the question regarding the UN resolution um, the House resolution you're referring to the uh, the boycott resolution, right? The BDS. No. The that's right. I'm aware of that. Um, I don't know if I can really elaborate on this. Maybe, uh, Nada, you can... Uh, use of funds. Use of, no use of funds that would... US That's right. I'm aware of that. Um, I don't know if I can really elaborate on this. Maybe, uh, Nada, you can... It is the first bill ever introduced in Congress that actually would be in any way critical of Israel. It's considered very low-hanging fruit because basically I mean, all it's saying is U.S. funds donated to Israel should not be used to abuse Palestinian children. It's that simple, you know? Uh, but it, it is, as I said, it's an absolute first in that finally, after all these years of Israel abusing Palestinian children and adults and grown up and all you, there's actually a bill introduced that funds donated to Israel should not be used, and it actually very specifically mentions some of Israel's abuses against Palestinian children, the, the administrative detention, solitary confinement, no access to lawyers, no family, no meeting, the parents are not there during their interrogation, the interrogation is in Hebrew, and all of that, so it actually mentions some of these. And it was introduced by Betty McCollum from Minnesota, and so far it has 19 Signatures, endorsers. So, uh, if that's the bill, that is that the bill you're asking about? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's how right. But also, what there's a resolution the for the United Nations. I know you're one of the signatories, and you were working some other people here to write it. And I don't recall exactly what. Oh it was yes, about. actually, we have so one of the founders of that. Taking the power to get 
uh, Rick, maybe you want to talk about it, because Rick is, is perhaps the, you are the founder, the you are the one behind this idea. The the first oh, yes, actually, we have one of the founders of that movement here. Uh, Rick, maybe you want to talk about it, because Rick is, is perhaps the, you are the founder, you are the one behind this idea. In the first place. Well, just <laughs> to give nice you a very quick answer, and I have some Here's reference. Here's the microphone. We just, uh, uh, I'll just talk loudly. Okay, we stumbled across a uh, uh, power that the General Assembly has, which is separate from the Security Council, that allows the General Assembly to make resolutions about anything to the entire United Nations membership. And we are trying to get them to do a resolution to end the blockade against Gaza. We've been to the United Nations three times, making a teeny bit of progress. But one thing I came here to do tonight is to hand out but some just one leaflets. quick thing I, I would so like to add that sharing that effort, please. That's just an example of how, effort. you know, seemingly ordinary people, I kind of again, another term that can be a bit tricky, seemingly ordinary people kind of take on this kind of initiatives and they gather the needed support and they go to New York and they meet with ambassadors from various countries and they enlist their help and their support and they start a movement that might get exactly what they want or it might end up being channeled somewhere, uh, somewhere else, but it's the energy, that energy of ordinary people. I mean, the idea here is that it's just not enough for us to feel bad about things. It's always good to actually try to think of how can I, as an individual who's part of a collective, a community, can actually make a difference. Now, there is another, resolu another um, bill that is being discussed in the Congress right now, and that is a bill that's going to criminalize the BDS movement. And I think it's a very important thing that we know what that is. Now, let me just tell you something really interesting here. At least I think it's interesting. Back in the day, before the, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, there was a law called the Secret Evidence Law. The Secret Evidence Law is to apply to people who are supposedly their crime uh, kind of divulging the nature of that crime could be understood as a threat to na national security. Therefore, they have to be prosecuted based on secret evidence. Even the lawyer of that person is not to know what that person's crime is. Shh, it's a secret. But then what happened is most of those who actually were prosecuted and imprisoned for it were Palestinians, right? So I remember when I was writing about it back in the day, um, I was thinking, you know, when I would interview people and write about this, you know, this is something that goes into the heart of your, of your law. This kind of reversed the entire American, you know, due process, judicial system. Why nobody seems to be bothered by it? Just because the victim is a Palestinian, usually Palestinian professors, uh, Professor Samuel Ariane, for example, was held for, for years based on this law and many others. It didn't seem to matter a great deal to people because the victim was a Palestinian. Then, after 9-11, the Patriot Act was introduced, one and then two. And many parts of it actually read as the secret evidence law on, st on steroids. So in other words, something that might not seem to touch you and affect you right now, eventually it will become part of this political culture and the legal system of this country. If we were listened to back then, Maybe we would have created some sort of a judicial boundaries to how far this kind of, of behavior and this kind of exploitation of the American ju judicial system can, can go. Why am I saying this? I am saying this because right now there is a law that is being passed and has a lot of support in the US Congress. It's, it, it was penned uh, and drafted by APAC by the Israeli lobby APAC. They wrote it word for word. And that is anyone who supports the BDS movement, any company, any individual, could go, be in jail for up to 20 years 
and pay fines up to $1 million. Okay. Now, again, it might not be very important to you now because it seems that it's touching only Palestinians, but it's not. It is something that you have to worry about, as an American as well, because that's a legal precedence, and that's going to affect you sooner or later. Right now, 22 states have criminalized uh, the BDS movement. 20, sadly, Washington State is one of them. Washington State, the governor of Washington State signed a letter with 50 others, 50 other governors that, is, that condemns the BDS movement uh, and accuses it of anti-Semitism and it's seen as the beginning of, uh, of, of legal procedures that would eventually make it illegal per the dictates of the state to actually support BDS. This is not a question of Palestine and the Palestinians. It's something that you have to worry about as well. I'm being told to finish because we have to go to dinner. So thank you so much for, for coming here, for listening to me, and for your support.